Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner, and it's great to have you all with us once again. And we'll be producing a series of productions and conversations about the rise of the right in America, the danger it presents, what we can do not just to confront it, but to stop it and build a different future. And one of those organizations at the forefront of the struggle has been the Poor People's Campaign. And one of its key leaders is the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris. A couple of weeks ago, she wrote an article entitled, How Do We Confront White Christian Nationalism? It was in TomDispatch.com and also featured in the Nation magazine where I first read it. The power of the evangelical, fundamentalist, right-wing Christian movement has always been a force in America. But so has its opposite, from the struggle for abolition to civil rights to this moment. Now, the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris has joined me numerous times over the years and joins us again today. She's co-director of the Cairo Center, co-founder of the Poverty Initiative, national co-director of the Poor People's Campaign, and wrote the book, Always With Us, What Jesus Really Said About the Poor. She's an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church and spent years of her life battling for social, economic, and political justice on the front lines with grassroots organizations from across the country. And Reverend Liz Theo Harris, welcome back. Good to have you with us. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. So I really love this article. I mean, I think that... It's funny, I, I, when I read this article, I had just finished reading a couple of articles about um, uh, Donald Trump's trumped-up Christianity <laughs> and how he uses this nationalist movement um, right. uh, to push his own agenda. Um, so let me just begin there. I mean, I, I talk, talk a bit about what you think is this dynamic now with Christian nationalism and where it fits into everything. Well... Uh, this is so important, right? And and it surely does not start with Donald Trump, and it it will not end, even if his uh, presidential hopefulness for 2024 is defeated. Um, but there is indeed a, a long uh, history of of development of of you know this Christian nationalism, but but the way it's it's kind of playing itself out in our our political and economic life today is is one of of real concern. Um, and that we we must pay some attention to. You know what we have is uh, really a um, a theology, an ideology that that uh, you know both blames poor people and immigrants and queer people and women for all of society's problems, pits us against each other, and then puts it all kind of on God, saying that that you know the true followers of 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 the God of history. Are are exclusive, are racist, um, you know, protect private property, you know, put forward this idea that Jesus was a card carrying member of the NRA. Um, <laughs> they, they they assert um, that the real moral issues of our day are are uh, you know who has sex with who, you know, about the the choice the health choices of women. Um, when when most of the issues that uh, these uh, Christian nationalists are, are taking a lot of time and effort around, aren't even in our sacred texts and traditions. Um, uh, and yet there's real silence coming out of, of many of these communities on the issues that, that Jesus and the prophets were, were very loud about. Um, and so, you know, and that is economic justice. That is um, people having a voice in, in the decisions that affect their lives. That is, you know, actually uh, critiquing those in power who would take the wealth and power of the world just for themselves and allow um, the deprivation of rights and of livelihoods of a majority of, of God's people. And so, you know, today what, what we have is, is a politic that has been really kind of veiled or framed. Uh, you know, one of my co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, Reverend Dr. Barber, often will talk about these Christian nationalists who pray, P-R-A-Y, over uh, politicians who pray, P-R-E-Y, <laughs> on the poor, on the immigrant, on the widow, on the child, on exactly who um, in our sacred texts uh, God has the most concern and most interest in caring for. So, you know, as you were speaking, one of the things that hit me, um, uh, this question is a little diversion from America, but I want to ask and come right back to our own country. I'm curious, um, as a theologian, as an activist, what do you think the dynamic is across the globe right now 
when you see this happening in Christian in, among many Christian denominations, you see it happening in the Jewish world as well, especially in Israel. You see it happening in the Isla- in the in the Muslim world um, with right with kind of real fundamentalists taking charge and 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 battling societies. You see it taking place in India with Hindu nationalists. You see it across the spiritual spectrum. I mean, what, what do you think that dynamic is? Why is that happening at this moment? And what for, and, and, and what do we have to contend with here? Well, indeed, there has surely been a rise of religious nationalism of all of of all stripes um, over the past decades. Um, and and you know, I think we actually have to look at the connection that 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 religious nationalism has to to both. Um, economic shifts and changes that are taking place uh, in the global economy, as well as um, the rise of these autocratic political um, movements um, who who kind of take advantage of economic shifts and changes and kind of prey on on vulnerabilities that that exist. And so, indeed, um, you know, all over the the, the globe. Um, there are these nationalistic movements that are gaining strength and who have some very uh, powerful um, uh, leaders who who then have very powerful bases in these nationalistic movements. I mean, you have it in Brazil, you have it in India, you have it re- really uh, across the world. I, I think there is something, though, to be said, especially about Christian nationalism, even the world whole over, um, because of of the the role that Christianity plays and has played, um, both being connected to uh, kind of colonialism, imperialism. Um, uh, I think in terms of of what what we're seeing now, um, you know, in different countries across the world, of these evangelical nationalistic movements that are gaining some traction amongst um, you know marginalized people, um, but then also from how rich and powerful uh, Christians in in this country, and sometimes not even very Christian people, um, but politicians, have have a real interest in in fanning the flames of nationalism and division um, and using kind of a particular theology uh, and and then kind of importing that um, uh, to to many of the kind of countries across the world where uh, the U.S. has been... um, you know, as Dr. King calls, a, a great purveyor of violence in the world. And so, you know, you, we see this um, in different parts of Africa. We see this in different parts of Latin America. Um, we see this, you know, really all over where, um, where 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 there's battles taking place around sexuality, around abortion, um, uh, but that are kind of really coming from um some elite players um, in the Christian nationalist movement in the United States. You know, it makes me think of the, one of the, you have a couple of quotes in your article um, from uh, Archbishop Tutu, um, one of our most amazing leaders uh, that maybe people that ever exist on this planet, at least in my lifetime. That's right. Um, and the quote is, what you just said reminds me of a quote that you, that you quoted in the article, which is, mm-hmm. when the missionaries came to Africa, they had the Bible and we had the land. They said, let us pray. We closed our eyes. When we opened them, we had the Bible and they had the land. <laughs> so I, I always love that quote and I'm glad you put that in there because it's so apt even for what we're facing in America today. And you see the land as a euphemism for what, we, what we're facing in this country today. That's right. I mean, so what we what we have, and again, this is this has been developing for decades. Um, it didn't just show up at the Capitol on January sixth, or even the the kind of religious rally that happened on January fifth. But but for decades, what has been developing in this country, very um, you know, very motivated, very uh, politically motivated, has been a, a movement of 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 Christians who have started to say. Um, you know, t- taken a position on on so many different issues, but but used, for instance, um, the desegregation of schools, um, and when they couldn't win on that, switched over to to a fight for abortion, and kind of uh, were able to kind of impose a, a racist framework. You know, in 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 political, you know, in local political governments all across the country, especially in the South, and and what we're seeing 
still is is the the rising influence of of this of these Christian nationalists and of especially the ideology um, that that is again I think really uh, attacking our democracy you know, uh, allow, allowing for very racist and anti-poor legislation to be being passed. Um, and that kind of just puts a veil on, on grave injustice that, again, our, our faith traditions, especially Christianity, have a very different message about. So the, these are two questions here. One is what you just said, uh, uh, what the struggle may portend, especially in the Christian world. But let me start with I mean, how critical is is this kind of, kind of, for want of a better term, right wing fundamentalist evangelical Christianity to the right wing surge and 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 to its takeover? You know, as we all both know that there are at least now twenty six state legislatures that are completely dominated by the far right, and they are dwindling down the, the right to vote across America, which is in one way in this in in this nation in this democracy to seize control legally. So, and how? How important is is this kind of Christian nationalism do that, and and what does that set up? So indeed, I mean we are are seeing the largest attack on voting rights um, in this country right now since the attack uh, that that came in Reconstruction, right, right after the Civil War, where we had these fusion governments all across the South of of poor white and um, formerly enslaved and 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 other freed people. Um, who had kind of come together, formed these new um, reconstruction governments, um, rewrote constitutions, um, put in you know beautiful moralistic language, but that about freedom and justice and and I mean you know in the North Carolina Constitution, for instance, you know the, that that constitution doesn't say just pursuit of justice. Um, you know, establishing justice. It also talks about, you know, the right to bear the fruit of one's labor, right? I mean, that that's enshrined in the constitution there because of these amazing reconstruction governments. And yet what has to happen for those in power to, to kind of grab their power back is, is to defeat, um, defeat reconstruction. And again, who, who helped to write a bunch of these constitutions and a part of these reconstruction, uh, uh, governments were, were pastors and, and moral leaders as well as, as those that were directly impacted. We're seeing something similar going on today because a multi, a multiracial democracy of poor and low income, black and Latino and native and white, um, and Asian and, and, are coming together across all of these different lines, they have the, those in power, you know, greatly scared. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it isn't really possible right now for, for those that can control the Republican party to win elections fairly, um, and to especially to win national elections. And so what you have is, is this, this, you know, intense attack on voting rights. Um, uh, you know, again, if, if all the, you know, and more than 400 voting rights, voter suppression laws are being, have been introduced since 2021 into 49 states and, and 19 of those states have already passed. Um, this will mean that in the next elections, 55 million people who voted in the 2020 election just will be disenfranchised. They, they won't have the same manners to vote, um, as they did in 2020. But we can't separate out this political attack, this attack on our democracy from this rise of Christian nationalism um, and this rise of kind of autocracy and, um, uh, and you know, pushing back uh, and the abridging of people's, you know, right to, to elect leaders that represent them. And, and, and a huge tool that has been used to, to, to allow for this huge ta- attack on on our, our rights and on our kind of uh, civil liberties is, is taking place through this veil again of Christian nationalism and by some very powerful Christian nationalist actors who have, uh, again, not just shown up overnight, but who have been building networks of media, you know, uh, building a base um, in different churches um, and, and taking political power um, by being very close to different political actors all across the country. And, and, and so, you know, this is, this is both, um, 
something that should be a cause for alarm. But again, it doesn't have to have the last word. Um, there are people pushing back and, and organizing. And, and this is why the Cairo Center and the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is just that. It's a moral revival because... Um, you know, our deepest moral values actually really push back against these extremists um, in our political views, as well as um, these these nationalists in our religious views. So let's explore that a bit more. I mean, and it, it just in terms of how this is confronted and how it's, and more, and more importantly, really, I think, to start talking about how it is defeated and how it is stopped um, and what that means. I mean, it, you know... Um, you have a great quote in your article. Let me just read this to our listeners, and I will encourage everybody at the end uh, to hit the link and to read the article because it's really well f- worth a read. Um, <clears throat> it's the vast majority of food, food pantries and other emergency assistance programs are run out of them, the churches. Uh, much of the civic work going on in churches is motivated by varying interpretations of the Bible when it comes to poverty. These range from outright disdain and pity to charity to more proactive advocacy and activism for the poor. You also write about how the, 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 the Bible belt is also, in the South is also the poverty belt. So the question is, what lessons we get from that? But also really, so how, how do you stop it? When you just said that they are, they, right now these, these states are disenfranchising 55 million potential voters um, through the most horrendous means, it's just, I mean, it's just so blatant the way they're trying to stop people from having the right to vote. Um, you know, and after, I hate to digress like this, but after kind of being as a young man in the South, in the civil rights movement, fighting for voting rights in, across America to see them be able to take it back. So what now in terms of the work you do and others around you doing actually can stop this and build a movement to replace it? Well, I, I really believe that, you know, I'm, I'm a pastor, I'm a biblical yes, scholar, <laughs> and, and, I, and I, I come to those, I mean, both from my upbringing, right? Um, I was raised in a family that was deeply dedicated to doing the work of justice, but, but from on my mother's part in particular, a very deep faith commitment. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I was a Sunday school teacher by 13. I was a deacon <laughs> by 16, right? I mean, I am the church, really? right? Um, <laughs> Uh, but but again, it was never separated that doing justice and advocating for an end to systemic racism. I mean, these were this was what you do, not just to be a good person, not just because there's injustice, but because of of that's what God and our faith traditions command. Um, and and that is really important. Um, you know. I've been doing grassroots anti-poverty organizing for more than 25 years and almost not a week goes by in my life when somebody doesn't come up to me and say, you know, I wish you would stop talking about ending systemic racism and poverty because don't you know, in the Bible, it says the poor will be with you always. Now, this does not just come to me from extremist Christian nationalists who would call themselves that right? This comes from anti-poverty activists themselves. This comes from scientists and, and religion scholars, right? That right now the dominant interpretation of our biblical texts, our sacred um, texts and theology really kind of, kind of says that it, that God condones injustice. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's others that, that are, that go a lot farther and say that, that again, God is going to, you know, punish um, poor people and women and, you know, all of this. Again, that's not biblically based. I mean, it's, it's, it's fine that people try to quote the Bible, but, but they always misquote it and, and, and can (laughs) often find very little biblical justification. But, but, but what folks have also done is, is allowed for this kind of overall interpretation of theology to, to justify poverty and inequality, um, especially in a, a very unequal and very poverty impoverished world and impoverished democracy. And so, so to me, one of the responsibilities, um, but also opportunities that our justice movements have is to reclaim a bunch of, of the biblical and theological foundations, but also just the values in our society, values that are enshrined in our constitution or who have been fought to be put there, you know, values that are, are in our, our just, in our communities uh, about justice and about, you know, fairness and about truth and about welfare, 
right? I mean, how is it possible that we have the word welfare in our constitution? And yet we're having a debate this many years into a pandemic about not getting a, a child tax credit to, to, to families that need it. Welfare is in our constitution providing for the common welfare. Well, let, let's just, let's just talk about this or, or, or for the general welfare, sorry. But, yeah. but, but, but that means that, that, that somehow we have allowed a small group of, of very powerful um, people to, to kind of redefine what, what our values even are. But if we don't allow the, that misinterpretation, if we, if we come together and say and show that you know, our, our sacred texts and traditions, but then also our justice movements are our are putting forward a different set of values. And, and that's that, you know, it says in our Bible, you can't honor and worship God without taking care of and welcoming your immigrant neighbor, um, organizing society around the needs of the poor. I mean, that, that's not because I want it to be there. It's because that's what's in Deuteronomy. You know, you, know, you, you have anti-poverty program and, and pro-justice program over and over and over in our, in our sacred texts. And, and, Oh, and we see movements, including the Poor People's Campaign, you know, take up those biblical and theological foundations and be able to push forward, you know, a new a new vision um, for, but you know, that's rooted in these values that that says that everybody must be in, uh, nobody can be left out, and that when you lift from the bottom, everybody rises. As so, as you were speaking, I'm thinking that <clears throat> sometimes the in the the inept in action sometimes of the Biden administration makes you worry about them as much as I do the right wing at times, <laughs> just in terms of what we face and what could we should be doing. So uh, just, I'd like to really kind of conclude with what leading up to June 18th, which I want people to understand and know about as we finish this conversation, but also real specifically what strategically are you all putting on the table about what we do and how we organize this defense as well as an offense about building the future and, 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 and not allowing us to kind of fall into a right wing nationalistic kind of nation. Cause I think we are under, I think we're under serious threat. I mean, I think that this is the most serious threat I've seen. I think America has had since for want of a better thought, since the late 1800s, late 18, 1877 when reconstruction was destroyed. You know, and on the heels of civil rights and all the other movements and all the things we, people fought for from the 30s to the 70s, seeing it all being dismantled and, and brought down again. So, I'm, I'm, and I'm really interested in, in what you think strategically has to be done and, and what you all are doing. So what we propose is that a moral fusion movement is is the answer uh, to, to Christian nationalism, to, to increased poverty, to, to all of the injustices that are kind of wreaking havoc on people's lives and livelihoods. And, and what we mean by that is moral and that it's rooted in our, our, you know, biblical and theological foundations and traditions, um, that, that talk about love for one another and, and again, you know, lifting from the bottom so everybody can rise, um, fusion in that it brings together people from all walks of life across all the barriers and, um, uh, and divisions that that right now are really being stoked in our society, and so you know across geography, across race, across religion, um, what we again saw in 2020, and what we are trying to do as we you know organize this moral march on Washington and to the polls is that one third of the electorate in 2020 was poor and low income, um, and 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 yet we have very little attention, conversation, and action around the needs of, you know, uh, of one third of the people that are, that are voting, um, in our elections and in battleground states back in 2020, it was upwards of 40, 45% of the electorate was poor and low income and across race, right. Uh, you know, native black, Latino, and poor white voting together, um, making the difference in terms of voting for candidates that said that they were going to raise wages and expand health care and address systemic racism and do the things that, that, that the majority of people in this country need um, to thrive and not just barely survive. And, and so 
this moral fusion movement that we're building is also about registering and and motiv- mobilizing and organizing people for a movement that then you know uh, can can vote um, can put you know independent political pressure on our uh, candidates and on our politicians by saying. Why, right now, we are living in an impoverished democracy, but the power to change that lies in the, the bodies and souls of, of poor and low-income people who are really kind of trying to build, a, a, as, as Reverend Dr. Barber has said, and, and we in the Poor People's Campaign put out, a third reconstruction, right? Um, and this one to fully address poverty and low wages and you know, address these abridgments and, and uh, uh, on voting rights and address you know, the climate crisis and the militarization of our communities and our world, and, and to address this false narrative of um uh of christian and religious all forms of religious nationalism and and so you know if we if we take even from someone like reverend dr king in the last years of his life who is who is proposing a poor people's campaign we take some of the strategy there that the achilles heel the weak point of our our current political system that is allowed for for um for such violence to occur to so many people um, and poverty and racism to exist and, and climate chaos, then, then by pulling those people together um, uh, and, and having folk, you know, organized to, uh, to, to take on at the same time systemic racism and poverty and ecological devastation and militarism and this narrative of, of Christian nationalism, you know, in this organizing, organizing, organizing kind of way through what we call, you know, moral analysis, moral articulation, and moral and, and moral action, then we we really believe that that that's a hope for the nation, um, and to to really save the soul of our democracy, and to to be able to put people, um, lift people up, and put people first. Well, Reverend Mr. Theo Harris, it's, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. And uh, um, before we leave each other t- today, um, I'm going to leave people with a quote that you started your article with from the Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, but I w- real quickly, just tell us a bit more, just very quickly, about June 18th and what you're building up towards so people understand what, what this means. Great. So June 18th will be a mass poor people and low wage workers assembly and a moral march on Washington into the polls. Um People from all across the country um, will will converge and convene in Washington, D.C. on that Saturday, June 18th uh, for a declaration, not just a day, um, where we're going to come forward with the the very solutions to the problems that exist um, around systemic racism and the suppression of voting rights, around poverty and low wages, around um, saving the earth and everything living in it, um, and around all of these issues, and, and show the power of poor and low income people. And so hoping that folks will be involved and invited to, to help to organize for this, you know, massive generationally transformative event. Um, we already on the poorpeoplescampaign.org website have buses that are being organized and, and mobilizing kits and information. And so hope that folks not just sign up to come and, and be in the numbers, but, but help to organize, um, you know, thousands of people to join us in Washington, D.C. And I'm going to leave you all, before we say goodbye to the Reverend Liz Theo Harris, at least for today, um, the, the, a quote that uh, the article opened up with, I think that uh, is really important. And I just love the things that Tutu has said. Um, and he said, he, he said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say that you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. <laughs> I love that quote. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Liz, thank you so much. Look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. It was great having you with us. And you can find links to the Reverend Liz Theo Harris's article and to the Poor People's Campaign June 18th Action in D.C. right here on our website. So please, let me know what you think about what you heard today, what you'd like us to cover. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com. And I'll get right back to you. And a really important reminder that Bill Fletcher Jr. and I will be producing a series on the rise of the right and what we can do to stop it coming out on The Real News in March. So for Dwayne Gladden, Stephen Frank, and the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care. <laughs>